Great job. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And drum me give a huge welcome to Julia Jammin. Hello. Yeah, thanks for coming Hi. out. Thanks. Yeah, we um, have been talking for, I don't know, a couple months now about bringing you into Dromeo, and yeah. um, finally it happened, so we're here, we're going to be so. teaching a lesson, and just a little bit about Julia, you are our first Romanian instructor, <laughs> all the way from Romania, which is crazy, she lives now in Vancouver, you've been drumming for what, about 12 years, you were saying? Yeah, yeah. Teaching for over five years? Yeah, at least um, five, six. Very cool. About, yeah. And you play in a band too, that was the song <clears throat> from your band, what is your band called? Um, band is Revenger, yeah. a thrash band from Vancouver, and I'm also in another band called Alchemy Chamber, which is like um, instrumental, experimental stuff, right. cello, saxophone, metal, awesome. drums. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm excited to have you out here. Um, hopefully we can have you out on more of a regular. Um, but let's get to the lesson. For all you guys watching here, please let you get your questions in. We're going to do a Q&A at the very end of this as well. And um, nailing transitions is the topic. Yeah. Well, obviously, everyone has problems with transition, at least from what I've seen, myself included. Um, so how are you going to help us with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an important subject because I, you can really tell how prepared a drummer is or how advanced they are by their transitions or how easily they can transition into um, the next part in a song. Um, so I, I picked a couple of examples um, of different types of transitions and the way that I kind of zoom in to um, specific parts of a fill or a beat and break it down so that I know exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I kind of cut my practice time um, by a lot. Really? Because I'm, if you zoom into a really small section of, of something, you can do it a hundred times in like two minutes, three minutes, hmm. and it just like, you lock it in way quicker. So this is more of like your system of how you fight transitional pieces. or Fight, yeah, yeah. yeah. physically fight. And this isn't about f um, fills necessarily? This Not necessarily, just... no. Okay. It could be like um, you're transitioning to a different part of the drum or you're transitioning, like your position is changing if you're going into a cross stick or um, just going from double kick to hi-hat. Um, if you're changing your position, you're changing your balance. So sometimes you don't really um, ask yourself what is what exactly am I doing in that moment? Right. So you kind of just sort of fumble through it for a split second, but then you get back on. So you're like, okay, that was okay. Right. Right. But actually, it was like a so cleaning those things up. Yeah. Yeah. Zooming in. I'm excited. Take it away. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess the first one, the first example, number one there. Um, it's, there's no fills, it's just two different beats. Um, this is kind of an example of something that I zoomed in one time and I was like, okay, I'm not actually doing it properly. Um, uh, let me just play it first mm -hmm. and then I'll kind of describe what I went through. So it's really slowly. Obviously I play it faster um, and it's a thrash beat, but this can apply to anything where you're accenting on the bell. Hmm. Um, because the accent in this case is on the downbeat on the one, two, three, four, but there's a crash on the one. Right. So what I noticed um, transitioning back is that when I would hit the crash, the first thing that I would hit would be the bell and that would be on the end actually, not on the downbeat. So there'd be a quick split second recalibration and that just makes it sound a little bit, you know, not as clean. So instead of going like this, I would go straight to the bell. Twice. And I've done then, that so many times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, it's something I've noticed, and I'm just like, I gotta figure out exactly what to do. So this example, you can play this example. Um, you can play it a lot faster too, or any uh, exercise where you're accenting on the bell. Um, but I just, uh, the idea of this one is to just um, slow it down and uh, figure out what the actual path is. So I know the first thing that I'm hitting is the crash, and then the snare, and then this part of the ride, and then the snare again, and then I go to the ride. So I just zoom into that one tiny section and I repeat that over and over like 10 times. I 
I know it, and that takes me 10 seconds, rather than doing a whole verse or a whole chorus or even just two bars. And then I know that section, and then I try the whole thing. Super important when you're going really fast. about it anymore you've like mem like used your muscle memory to memorize it properly right right yeah. so you're literally just focusing on the last quarter note and the first quarter note of that transition yeah yeah and just really isolating where your body should be going where your hand should be going yeah kind of like carving the path properly so there's no obstacles when you're going through it right, right especially when you're going fast or you have adrenaline like a live show or you know just you don't have enough time to to think your way through it it mm -hmm. has to be automatic like grooved in it's kind of like those guys that if they have a problem with one fill in a song, they'll play the whole song. The whole song. Yeah. Yeah, like why? Like yeah. you can spend 10 minutes and perfect it. And um, it, se it seems obvious sometimes, but it really... I mean, I'm, I'm guilty for that too. I, I oh, me to. too. 100%. <laughs> it seems like obvious, but we don't song. do it sometimes. We just yeah. don't do it, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I mean, that's just a simple concept. Just zoom in. And it's at the time, it, even for me, it seems like... Oh, I, it's gonna take forever, and it literally takes two minutes, and like that's not a huge time investment. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes you feel like you want to play, like play the whole song, but it's way more fun if you just fix that one problem really quickly. It's almost like you, people always say, "Later, I'll fix that later," or eventually that'll sort itself yeah. out. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, it's it's totally worth it, and it takes way less time than you think it does, especially if you, if you don't feel like you're in the mood to do it, just do it. Right. Yeah, and you'll, you'll be thankful. That's a big tip right there, yeah. Yeah. All right, what's next? Cool. Um, the second one is way different. It's just a 6-8 beat. Um, super simple. Um, it's uh, just a 6-8 beat with the back beat on the 4, um, switching to um, a cross stick with the back beat on the 1, the and of 2, the 4, and then the and of 5. Um, and the reason why I picked this one is because I'm going from playing um, the snare normally with my stick to go into a cross stick. Um, so first of all, I, I hold my stick like this because for in this particular beat, um, I don't feel like I have time to switch. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can and I can flip it, but in this case, I just start off that way. Um, I don't like to play like this all the time because of the splinters, but it's fine. But the main thing is how my balance changes in this one. So I use this one as an example to um, really be aware of where you're positioning your body because I'm playing an open hi-hat and I've seen so many of my students lift their foot completely off of the hi-hat when they're trying to play an open hi-hat. And I really suggest you don't because you, you totally lose mm. one of your anchors. Um, so I always like to do um, heel, just heel up, just lift up um, from your toe. And also you're going from just playing normally to a cross stick and that means I'm moving forward a little bit. So I just try to be aware, I go through this exercise really slowly and I try to be aware of where my body position is. And if anything feels uncomfortable, I try to readjust. Sometimes I have to move the, the hi-hat a little bit further um, or just place myself somewhere different. Um, so. Uh, yeah, if you're playing a song that starts off sort of differently, just keep it in your mind that maybe, oh, in this song I have to just kind of position myself a little bit differently. Right. And just start off a little bit better. Um, so it's, um, the beat itself is just... simple, but um, I'm just being very aware of where uh, where my placement is, and when I'm going for the open hi-hat, I know the next thing that I'm hitting is all of them at the same time. Hmm. So just that um, awareness of where my body placement is, 
um, really helps me. And I go really, really slow, like super slow. And yeah, then I sh usually can get it a lot quicker that way. Uh, let's hear that super slow. Faster. Cool. Now, would you, would you ever take that same concept you taught in the first one, which is just like hi highlighting just the transition and use that for something like this? Totally, yeah. It's, it's kind of a, a habit for me right now, and I get all of my, my students to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I realize now that not a lot, everybody does that, but um, I just get them to, to really focus on even two beats or three beats. So like the last beat or the last note and the first note. Uh, just consciously being aware of it, just like looking at the tab or figuring out what you're doing and consciously being like, oh, that's the last note and this is the first note. It, it just helps you be more aware of, right. of where you have to go because you're doing everything so quickly sometimes you think you know. And then when you get to the point where you're playing more improv and you're jamming with someone, then you don't have time to think of that. It should come naturally. So yeah. this is good practice for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just puts you in that position. Um, and if there's something about... Um, going through something really slowly and just like a, a one piece, like one section of it, mm -hmm. I feel like it, it goes um, in a little bit deeper in your memory or <clears throat> in your coordination than just uh, practicing like a whole exercise with the metronome. Yeah, and this one here, we're going from snare to cross stick and from open hi-hat to, um, well, from ride to open hi-hat. So there's two, two key things there. Yeah, yeah, the, the backbeat changes and, and also uh, landing a cross stick. Um, I'm not an expert at cross stick, but um, I know that uh, sometimes it's a little bit, you know, you kind of can flam. So just practicing, like... Landing that one note right after the hi-hat and knowing where uh, where you like to hear the cross stick. And yeah, just figuring out exactly the, the position that you want to be in when you do that, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, so uh, I think the third one, or third one there, yeah. Yeah. Cool, yeah, so uh, this one is, um, uh, I wanted to put a triplet fill in one of them because uh, what happens when I play triplet fill sometimes or anybody else is that it tends to kind of speed up and you lose where the one is. And um, I really kind of encourage um, not only playing this exercise but playing um, the rhythm on your snare when you do it. Um, so I'm just going to play the, the whole exercise all the way through a couple of times really slowly, and then I'll kind of break it down. I'll go through it. So that in itself, if you were to play, if you're practicing like a, a triplet fill, um, you could just like practice the whole exercise of the whole fill and um, just kind of work the, the triplets through there. But what I like to do is whenever I'm reading, sight reading, or trying to figure out a fill by ear, is I always take the rhythm and I play it on my snare or on a rudiment pad or I just like figure out what the rhythm is. So if I look at the, the rhythm on top, I know I'm going from eighth notes to triplets, um, back to eighth notes, and then 16th notes. Mm -hmm. So um, if you go to B, um, exercise 3B, I put the whole um, rhythm just on the snare. Oh, brilliant, okay. Right? So, um, yeah. so um, instead of uh, going through the whole exercise, 
I try to figure out, I want to hear the rhythm in my head first mm -hmm. so that I know what's right. Um, and then I know if I'm speeding up or slowing down. Um, so I'll just, if I play that whole rhythm, it'll just sound like this. do that over and over and I get the sound of it in my head, I'm way more likely to, to nail that whole uh, transition going into the next part because it's way simpler to practice. So I can do that like, over and over um, a lot more times and um, uh, get it in my head, rhythmically yeah. at least, rather well, than having to think about the orchestration of it. I was just going to say a lot yeah. of times the, the orchestration is just as hard and you're yeah. just fighting the note value changes. Yeah, you're trying to do two things at yeah, once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just simplify it and um, separate the two things and uh, figure out what the rhythm is. And I've um, and sometimes a fill, if you're listening to a fill, um, the rhythm of the, the fill is more important sometimes than exactly what tom you're hitting. Because everybody tunes their toms differently. Um, so the pitch is not as important sometimes as the rhythm. Like I'll be more impressed if you can figure out what the rhythm of that fill is. And you can also take, you know, liberties with the orchestration of it sometimes. But the rhythm is so much more important. Right. I always start there. Right. Yeah. This could obviously apply the eighth notes, triplets, sixteenth notes, any note value yeah. change you have, even if it's some chord notes to sixteenth note triplets. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, that uh, particular exercise. It's, it's also a little bit tricky because the first fill starts on the first beat and the second fill starts on the fourth beat. So it's uh, uneven in where it starts in the fill, so it kind of really gets you to focus on where you are. Um, and you should be counting, definitely, when you're doing that. Yes. It's definitely. It was, took me a long time to... Yeah. Count out loud. It made a huge difference. Even if it's though. embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. Your voice is like a fifth uh, limb. Yeah, it's of. like singing, singing the rhythms almost. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. That's a great tip. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, those three kind of concepts of like zooming into a really small section of um, of a rhythm, um, making sure that you're in a comfortable position and in the right spot, um, and also. Um, breaking down the rhythm to, to its most simple form, just playing it on your snare and uh, understanding what it sounds like unorchestrated. Very cool. Yeah. So we got another one that has like A, B, C, D. Yeah, Whoa. lots of examples. Yeah. <laughs> what is this one about? Um, all of that one is uh, basically everything that I've kind of mentioned before um, in um, just a few more examples of each. But more importantly, each one of them is a transition from a quarter note hi-hat to an eighth note hi-hat, um, which can be a little bit tricky. The most important thing when you're playing any, any of those exercises is that the, the thread of the rhythm, like the bass and the snare, is always the same and the dynamic of all of them are the same. Mm -hmm. So you keep the rhythm going and this should just be on top like your hi-hat, the quarter note or the eighth note, um, should be unaffected, should not be affecting the actual rhythm. So I did four different examples. Um, they're all kind of related. They kind of get a little bit more complicated. Um, basically just adding more basses. Mm -hmm. So it uh, starts off a little bit simple and <clears throat> I add more and more basses as we go. <laughs> Yeah, I can see that. So this is all eight bar examples here. We're, we only have four that we can display on screen at once. So Kyle will try to do it his best to, to, to change them, but uh, follow along with the sheet music. Why don't you just walk us through uh, very quickly all four. Okay, so um, uh, the first one uh, starts off with quarter note, hi-hat, and there's a really small 16th note fill at the end, just and a uh, at the um, end of the fourth bar. And then it immediately goes into the same rhythm but with an eighth note hi-hat um, on top of it. Um, 4B is uh, basically just an extra bass on the uh, I believe, of one. And um, I think that was it. And then the C is just an extra bass note on the and, like end of two. 
that one's through uh, C, yeah. And um, a bass on the E of four, which right. is what I really like putting a bass on E right after the snare. Yeah. Um, sounds really cool, a little bit more funky. Uh, the last one is um, a little bit harder. It has two uh, 16th note basses in the beginning. So that one will be, I think, the trickiest one to switch the, the feel from quarter note to eighth note, because um, you got 16th notes all the way through um, the first beat. So that one is really gonna be like the test to see how comfortable you are holding the, the rhythm and uh, changing up the hi-hat. All right. Um, but I'll go through each one. Um, I'll start with 4A. Um, I guess I'll just do it once through, like I'll do the four bars with quarter note hi-hat and then the four bars with eighth note hi-hat. And uh, yeah, we'll see. That you can trend, you can like mm -hmm. repeat over and over and over, but um, the really important thing is that that bass and snare are the same. Like it's not being affected. For that example, I think it's it's pretty easy. But if that's too hard, just go back. Start off with that, obviously. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, just and it's a cool tool to if you're writing drums, writing drum parts, um, it's a really cool way to kind of pick up the, the pace of the song without, um, without making anything louder or actually playing faster, which you shouldn't be doing. Right, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so B is uh, just an extra 16th note on the first beat, um, and that's about it, yeah. Throw up number C. Yeah, do the third one real quick. So this one's just an extra bass on the two, on the end of two, and on the E of four. Sweet, let's go to number D. Yeah, number D. Number D. Number D. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this one's cool. This is just a one extra bass. Um, I do find some of my students have a little bit of trouble with that, that extra bass in there, so I just separated this one. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that if I were um, if I was having trouble with that, and um, I did make a few mistakes there, um, I would just go back to all of my um, uh, my ideas from from the beginning. So I would zoom in, and I'll see kind of what I'm doing at the end of the first one and the beginning of the ne uh, the next bar. So um, 
the last bar of that, um, the fourth bar of the fourth, or the fourth beat of the fourth bar, um, uh, well, that whole rhythm. So that last part. I'll figure out exactly what I'm doing there. zoom into that one section and I'll repeat it over and over right. until I, I get it. And then sometimes uh, it might just be the, the rhythm itself. I'll figure out what the, the rhythm at the end is and the rhythm at the beginning. So the last two beats of, of that exercise is... Um, Three and four e and a one e and a two and right. So I'll just figure out that because maybe that was the problem. Maybe I, I think it's a different rhythm. So I'll break it down and I'll play that rhythm. Okay, so it's three and four e and a one e and, three and four e and a one e and a two and. And I'll just kind of play through that. Um, And four e and a one e and a two and I'll figure out exactly what that totally section is. Very um, cool. Yeah. So the three main points: isolate, even if it's just a two quarter notes worth of, of transitional piece, isolate it. Yes. Second point: um, making sure. Well, the third point. Sorry, let me jump ahead. Picking out the rhythm behind it. Yeah. And what was the second point? Uh, balance. Balance, correct. Yeah, figuring yeah. out where where you're sitting and uh, uh, your placement. Yeah. And um, Figuring out if you actually have to switch where your kind of where your balance is, if you have to move forward or lean back a little bit. Very um, cool. Yeah. yeah. And you know the the sheet music in this lesson, it's not like you have to learn the exact things that we notated here or that Julia notated here. Uh, this is just examples of the points, the three points that we just talked about there. Um, but they are great ways to practice those points. They highlight and isolate certain uh, um, key trouble issues that we all have as drummers. Um, but yeah, take those tips and apply them to every time you are having issues with the transition. Transitions aren't just fills. I know a lot of people were, were asking me, is that just about fills? Is lesson about fills? No, it's about just transition from two different parts yeah you know and you even had a fill in there which was part of the transition eight notes to st uh, eight note triplets right yeah 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 and um, uh, just figuring out uh, where exactly you're you're playing everything and being aware of what you're doing yeah mostly yeah all right everyone thank you so much for tuning in all right thank you Julia for coming out yeah thank you hope we'll see you out here again Leave a comment below if one of your questions wasn't answered within the lesson or within this Q&A, and we'll see you guys all later. To close us out, Julia Jammin, <laughs> playing a Revenger tune. See got you guys. it. You got it.